there was some, you know, a kerfuffle between the doors uh, manager and, and Jim Morris and a concern about them being booked to close the show because they were aware that the show was imminently going to be canceled. Ticket sales were terrible until mm -hmm. John Lennon came on board and then it like, exploded. And they were concerned that they would go on and close the show as they were contracted to do, but people would leave after John Lennon played. So mm -hmm. they came to me and they said, look, could you get John out of the dressing room and could we have a little chat? And, you know, the, the manager for the door said, you know, John, we, we like uh, to go on before you and have you close the show. At which point John was like horrified. He was like, close the show. You know, he was terrified enough. And, but it was like, you know, you're the you're the headliners. He's looking at Jim Morrison like astonished. You're the headliners. And as that conversation I was going imagine. down, little Richard comes by and kind of overheard that. And he comes walking up to us. And he goes, I will close the show the way the show should be closed by me, the king, little Richard. You know that, Mr. Lennon. You know that, Mr. Promoter. You know that, Mr. Doors. And everybody was just Mr. Doors. By. He called and Jim little, Morrison little Richard Mr. Doors. was basically <laughs> spanking these two guys. And, and oh, little man. Richard was due to go on next. And I said, Richard, thank you so much. There had been a kerfuffle about the piano. I said, you know, that piano is my personal one. I had it brought for you. That wasn't true, but it made it sound good. And so <laughs> he, he walked away. And he wasn't more than 15, 20 feet away when he goes, I am the king. You know that. It's Johnny Late Night. And now here's your host, Johnny Rogers. Welcome back, everyone, to episode number 65 of The Johnny Rogers Show. My guest on the podcast today is the subject of a brand new documentary called Revival 69, The Concert That Rocked the World. The film revolves around the incredible story of how, against all odds, a life-changing concert came together. And this never-before-documented story reveals a series of colorful characters, murky deals, and broken promises. And holding it all together was a young, renegade Toronto concert promoter who was assembled an all-star lineup for the concert. It included Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis, Bo Diddley, Gene Vincent, Alice Cooper, and The Doors. Not only that, but John Lennon was booked one day before the show via a crazy set of circumstances. Then he performed for the first time without The Beatles, doing an impromptu concert with the Plastic Ono Band, which featured Yoko Ono, Eric Clapton, Alan White, and Klaus Vormann. Then ultimately that performance became the push that Lennon needed to actually leave the Beatles. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further delay, please welcome the greatest concert promoter of all time and a legend in the world of rock and roll, Mr. John Brower. Well, I don't know if I can live up to all of that, but thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> I had I'll to set you up. That. Send me that, send me that. I'm gonna post that on my fridge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, truly, like, how does it like, how does it feel to be, you know, in when we look back on it, like a, it was a truly I'm sure in the moment when you're like putting this all together, you're just thinking like, let's just get through this, you know, let's absolutely. Because, correct. I, and yeah, I have been asked that, and that is that is the answer. Uh, I, we just have to get through this. We don't sit there thinking, oh, we're making history. They'll probably make a movie about this. Yeah. You know. Well, they were making a movie about it, but that's a whole other story. Wow. And um, I, there was one part that really stuck out to me because like I've had a couple moments like this in my career where um, it, with you, it was with Chum Radio Station where you're going in and you're trying to convince someone like, look, this is going to happen. We're going to win at this. We just need your little push to help us in the right direction here after you were able to secure john lennon and the whole concert was done did like a part of you want to go into those chum offices again and kind of you know rub it in their face a little bit that you actually no, pulled no, it no, off no. ron ron did not include it in his film so i, I can share this so i'm not supposed to tell stuff in the film um the minute that john lennon arrived at heathrow airport he gave an impromptu press conference at the curb because, of course, there were a lot of media people out there that were lurking around. And uh, when the you know Rolls Royce rolled up with the John and Yoko in it, um, he gave a press conference saying, I'm on my way to Toronto. I'm going to play a rock and roll show with Chuck Berry and all of these things. And, of course, that 
came up on the teleprompter, which used to be in the newsrooms back in the day. The ticker tape would, would spit this out. And when it spit it out at Chum, they ran in and went right on the air with it, took credit for it. And we're wow. going, Chum Presents, worldwide exclusive. Chum Presents, Toronto Rock and Roll Revival. It was solo appearance, John Lennon, Eric Clapton. And that's how, God bless them, because that's how the other 10,000 tickets sold. Uh. And, 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 and that's why I have to say that we gave them a break in the film um, and didn't chastise them too much for it. <laughs> it was hard, kind of hard to believe. I mean, when you think about it. And there was a tiny little backstory that Kenny Walker and I had been promoting the uh, Magical Mystery Tour movie. We were given the movie earlier in the year and we sold out uh, the O'Keefe Center. It was called that then. I don't know what it's called now. And uh, Klein Hands in Buffalo and the St. Lawrence Center, I believe, in Montreal. And in Ottawa, at the Elgin Theater, which was a 2,500-seat theater, we only had like three, 400 tickets sold the night before. And we were at the Chateau Laurier, and I called one of the uh, young hostess girls over and said, listen, we'll give you 10 tickets if you call this guy and tell him you saw George Harrison here having dinner with some friends. Well, she didn't realize they gave her the phone number inside the studio on the radio station. So she calls, and the guy put her on the air, and made her describe what George was wearing. She had to fake all of that. But she said, but all my friends and I are going to see the movie tomorrow. Well, they were lined up at eight in the morning to buy tickets. We sold out the show, another 2,100 tickets. So when we came back to Toronto, that was one of our good stories. Like, hey, hey, hey. Well, Chum heard that. So the second time when we came in with the tape with Anthony Fawcett, they were like, hey, you know, the Beatles must love you guys, right? You got a bombing movie in Ottawa. Now George Harrison's in town, but nobody sees him. And now your festival's bombing. But John Lennon's coming to play with Eric. Like, yeah, Get sure. Out. Get out of here. So God bless Chum. They sold out the show. All the people from Detroit were already in town in the stadium. But people were climbing over the uh, north wall to get in and we had to actually let in about 1500 people um wow. at the northwest gate we didn't have any more tickets to sell them and it was just a question of look you know we sold out a show that was going to be canceled five days ago open the gates and let these people in so about 1500 people came in uh, compliments of the fact wow. that we were pretty happy about everything yeah and i, I mean i uh, like that just probably made that environment feel, you know, just so much more alive too. like an extra 1500 people really changes, you know, the situation, yeah. especially if they got in for free, you know, let alone. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> they, they were coming in, in, in one massive movement of people. Wow. So it wasn't like they were dribbling in, they were outside pushing and the police were there on horseback and the police were like, what, you know, this could get dangerous here. So uh, I just made a decision to open the gates and let them in. And it, it did swell the crowd and it, it brought these people that were coming in like laughing and having fabulous time because from chaos outside the gates, now they were in for yeah. free. And they're happy. They're ha like, and they were happy. Calm Everybody them down, happy. right? Yeah. That was the happiest day of the year in Toronto. Please. Oh, I can imagine. Like it just that lineup alone is just unheard of. Like and and the names just keep going. And this is something that I, I really want to um, touch on with you and get your thoughts on it. But I'm a huge believer in if you have like a creative thought or idea or passion that you should really act on it because you don't know what the ripple effect of that action is going to be and it's scary sometimes like you had your life threatened at one point you didn't know if you were going to sell out this show there was deals dropping out and you're trying you're just pushing 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 and persevering to really make this happen and i think what shocked me the most is like you know if this concert didn't happen you had getty lee of all people in the audience on like he was there and he says like, you know, this inspired me to, you know, move into my music career even further. And it was just, I'm like, man, if this concert didn't happen, then Getty Lee doesn't happen. Then Lennon doesn't leave the Beatles. Then the, even the lighters, you know, that whole like part of it, it just boggles my mind. So in those moments where you have this creative thought, what, what is the, the motivation for you personally to, acting on that despite all odds 
Well, you know, the, the uh, Matches and Lighters was created by Kim Fowley, who's also the one who inspired me to call John Lennon. And of course, wow. that that's cr- created everything. My inspiration at that at moment was to ask Edjo to get like as many bikes as he could together and let's escort John and Yoko in from the airport because I knew we were going to be filming. So like, let's have the Royal coach and, uh, and you know, the Knights of Armour in front and back. <laughs> and Edjo, of course, loved it and put that whole thing together. And one thing the film shows is that whole situation rolling out and happening, which I did not see because I was, you know, promoting the show. And and there was a two hour window of time that it took to organize all that. And Mm -hmm. Kenny Baker's people were there filming it. And this is footage that Ron Chapman, the director, who is like got to be given an archaeological award or something for (laughs) finding this film. If there's an award for archaeology and finding film, he needs to get it. Because he dug and found this film, some of which hadn't even been developed or processed, I guess you call it, and uh, put it together magically. There's so many stories in the movie that that are just circumscribed around the theme of the of the event, but things that were happening, told by people that Ron managed to get in front of a camera and engage in conversation. It's not like they're sitting on stools being mm-hmm. interviewed. Um, although Anthony Fawcett is, but he's a brilliant interview. And this is a man that never gave an interview um, since the 70s when he had made some kind of an agreement with John and Yoko never to give any interviews about the time that he spent with them. And he wow. just told Ron, Ron campaigned for a year to get him to agree to talk. And uh, and he gave some great anecdotes and great stories. He's a charming storyteller. And just his... Uh, his interviews alone are just priceless. So, and, you know, watching Edjo, the leader of the Vagabonds, have a fabulous time during the day. I didn't know that. I mean, it was just great to see all yeah. these people interacting with each other. And Danny Taylor, you know, uh, you know, playing drums with Chuck. I mean, how that happened. You have to see how that happened in the movie. It just, the way it comes together is just like totally unbelievable. You go to a show as somebody that's got a ticket and then you end up playing drums with Chuck Berry. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, like what, <laughs> you know, and he's like AD. And then the craziest thing is there's no in-ear monitors. They don't know what, there's no metronome. They don't know what they're, they're playing. They, they turn to Chuck, they go, what are we playing? And he goes, I, well, what key are we in? And Chuck goes, well, I haven't found it yet. <laughs> yeah. Like my nerves would have been just, I would have been well, so here, on edge. Like, we- all right, here we go. <laughs> Huey, Huey Leggett put it perfectly. He said, you know, you just wait till Chuck starts and you just know that's the song. And OK, here we go. We're half a beat behind. I mean, that's real musicians. Like, I, I, I don't know if there's too many musicians today that could do that, that could just yeah. ju- jump into, you know, a situation like that. I mean, kudos to them. What I loved about it and uh, it, I, you kind of get this. It's a little bit different in the comedy world. This is what I appreciate about music in the comedy world. If there's a lot of really good comedians on stage, they'll almost jokingly say to the the guy before them, you know, like save save some of the laughs for me. Like don't tire yeah. them out, you know. They were, yeah, they yeah. Might, they might just kill them with jokes and you got people falling over and then the room's kind of dead when the next person comes on at a certain point. Right. And, uh, but with, with this show, it was like legend after legend after legend, but everyone was just trying to, it felt like outdo the previous performance in their own way. Right. Like Alice Cooper going crazy on stage and, and, uh, hurling the chicken. And there's all these like, you know, unique controversies within each performance, which I thought was just phenomenal. Well, you know, it, it was. And, the you know, the performance by Alice Cooper is magical. It was performance art. And, you know, for the doors to be on one side of the stage and John and Yoko and Eric Clapton on the other side of the stage watching it. I mean, it was theater and and it's brilliantly shot and it's footage that has not been seen before because there were a lot of small cameras that Ron discovered that um, had footage on them that had never been processed, as I said. And, mm. you know, some of it was just absolutely magical close up footage um, that you just, you know, you're there, you're right there on stage for so much of this and backstage and in the interviews, you know, hearing these stories um, 
And as I've described before, you know, Ron's created like a roller coaster ride where you come up to the top and it's going to be all, it's all wonderful. And then, whoa, down we go. And it's <laughs> going to be cancel and chaos and everything. We go around a bend. Oh, there's a rescue here. And there's yeah. a little <laughs> incline and we're okay. And we're going up and oh no, another disaster. <laughs> you know, <laughs> It's like, you don't know till the end of the movie, whether this thing can happen or not. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I love about, um, you know, a good director and a good editor as well knows how to take all these, you know, found footage that all over the place and stories and interviews and just he pieced it together so well. I, I can't wait. I'm going to have an interview with Ron as well. So talk to him more about the directing side. But I really relate to you in terms of event producing, because like as a comedian, we kind of have to do that ourselves, right? Like if people aren't willing to put us on stage, we create our own stages um, yeah. and, and, you know, hopefully build an audience around that too. If there's any, you know, concert or event promoters out there do you have uh, advice that you go to when people are asking you you know like what makes a successful event or well first of all um and ron has pointed this out and 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 so did chef gordon in the film you know back in the day and i was blessed to be there back in the day and remember i had had the rock pile club for a year at the masonic temple brought led zeppelin brought the who brought mm. jeff back i mean i had you know background and experience in all that um today it's very corporate and in like the rest of the world i mean it's all become the walmarts and the live nations and aeg there's there's very little opportunity to break into something on that level. But I love the idea of, of people being smaller promoters and putting on events with smaller bands. Those, those promoters need to realize they're as important to the continuation of the industry and to the musicians as any Live Nation or AEG is that's basically bringing you the top line entertainment. And they also do a great job of putting opening acts on there and helping break bands. I mean, I'm taking nothing away from the great job. I mean, I've been to a few Coachellas and just walked around with my jaw hanging down, you know, like going, wow, man. I mean, these guys, like, they are really doing it here. This is like a madhouse and a circus and, you know, hundreds of people rushing from one stage to another. I mean, it's it's the, the rush of the modern world, but it's done so well and it's executed so well. And kudos to all of those people. Mm. Do you, like, because I get this sometimes, um, I've, I've done background acting in movies. So now when I watch a movie, it kind of, ruins the experience for me because I'm, I'm paying attention to the little things that I know are happening behind the scenes. When you go to an event like Coachella, are, does your producer brain kind of click in and you're like, I wonder how much this all costs? Like, what's the security detail here? Like, are you still well, thinking in that brain? Actually, no, I, I, my Coachella experiences have been about taking my kids and mm. uh, hiding out in the VIP area while they're out there and checking back in every couple of hours from the time they were 13 till they were about 16. And then after that, they just didn't want to go anymore. They'd already outgrown it. They were on to other things. But of course, I would note the incredible production, the execution and how I mean, I, I was backstage as a guest of uh, Dave Grohl when he had them Crooked Vultures uh, as a band that were headlining. And, uh, you know, one thing I did notice is that all of the artists had their own compounds, whereas back in the day in the festivals, everybody mingled, everybody was mm. hanging with each other. And you'll see that in the film that there's this camaraderie and this wonder where Alice Cooper's standing there, you know, like totally unknown and looking around going, wow, man, you know, like, wow, there's so-and-so and there's so-and-so and, -so, and people were talking to each other, you know, uh, you'll see that in the film you'll see these this yeah. communication between between these disparate groups of people who are all experiencing the camaraderie of this magical event at the same time from the same place backstage mm. yeah there's a there's a great moment too where chuck berry says to one of the camera lady goes wow that's john lennon <laughs> and she's like you're chuck berry yeah. <laughs> like, you know but know. we were all still like it's so great when artists are fans of other artists because then you can that's shared knowledge right like i i couldn't imagine the conversations that were happening uh that night just about uh, you know music in general or performance in general or ideas and dreams and hopes that they wanted to go for 
Um, yeah. the, the plane stuff is the craziest to me. John Lennon, Eric Clapton, and them coming over on the plane and, and literally making the set list on the plane, which is um, mind boggling. What did you think when you saw that footage? Uh, I, I, I absolutely that? loved it. Yeah, I, I absolutely loved it because it's so cinema verite. I mean, it's just like you're right there. You're with them. Uh, you're going through that moment with them of like, what are we going to do? And well, what key, well, what key will it be in? And, you know, sitting, I mean, there, that picture of them sitting, a still picture of them sitting in the airplane has been uh, circled around for a long time. But then when you hear the conversations and you have Anthony Fawcett giving you a blow by blow of what it was like, etc. cetera. Um, there's a very great story I'll share with you quickly. Um, no, 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 that's not in the film. That time. <laughs> and, uh, it's uh, there was some, you know, a kerfuffle between the doors uh, manager and, and Jim Morris and a concern about them being booked to close the show because they were aware that the show was imminently going to be canceled. Ticket sales were terrible until mm. John Lennon came on board and then it went like, exploded. And they were concerned that they would go on and close the show as they were contracted to do, but people would leave after John Lennon played. So mm. they came to me and they said, look, could you get John out of the dressing room and could we have a little chat? And, you know, the, the manager for the door said, you know, John, we, we like uh, to go on before you and have you close the show. At which point John was like horrified. He was like, close the show. You know, he was terrified enough. And, but it was like, you know, you're the you're the headliners. He's looking at Jim Morrison like astonished. You're the headliners. And as that conversation was going imagine. down, little Richard comes by and kind of overheard that. And he comes walking up to us and he goes, I will close the show the way the show should be closed by me, the king, little Richard. You know that, Mr. Lennon. You know that, Mr. Promoter. You know that, Mr. Doors. And everybody was just Mr. Doors. By. He called and Jim little, Morrison little Mr. Doors. was basically <laughs> spanking these two guys. And, and oh, little Richard man. was due to go on next. And I said, Richard, thank you so much. There had been a kerfuffle about the piano. I said, you know, that piano is my personal one. I had it brought for you. That wasn't true, but it made it sound good. And so <laughs> he, he walked away. And he wasn't more than 15, 20 feet away when he goes, I am the king. You know that. He's a high <laughs> voice. And so I said to John, please, look, just go in the dressing room. And I, I said to Jim and, uh, and the manager, I said, look, you know, you're contracted to close the show. You know, uh, John Lennon cannot be squeezed into that position right now. We just can't do that. And and Jim goes, yeah, you're right. We'll, we'll close the show, but we got to be on stage for John and Eric. And I said, no problem. You can be on stage. Jim had been on stage with the other fellows in the band for most of the afternoon um, mm. watching, you know, these these people. And, and that was something that was an amazing thing that, you know, these superstars that can sell out arenas or sell out stadiums were standing in awe watching, you know, the rock and rollers that inspired them. And Ron captures a great moment uh, that I won't share uh, when Jim uh, Morrison acknowledges what it meant for him to be there that day. And mm -hmm. it's a very powerful moment. And, uh, and it's a, it's a really leveling moment in the film where you realize, wow, you know, whoa, that's Jim Morrison. Yeah, and I, I mean, like, I think that's also what makes a really great show as well is when you can have artists on the the lineup that respect each other a little bit. And it's not it's not just like big names. It's it's artists who are like, no, 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 that person influenced me. Like you had three generations of rockers. You had yep. like the old school rockers who inspired the current headliners, the doors. And then you had Alice Cooper looking at all of them going like, God, I want to be like all of these guys, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. It, it was just like a perfect, a perfect lineup. Um, yeah. And, you know, you finally, you finally hear the entire true story of the chicken incident with yes. Alice Cooper, yeah. which we will not discuss or share because it's, no, no. it's a treat. It's a highlight. It, of it's the... <laughs> such a treat. It's one of the highlights of, of the movie uh, because so many people, you know, that I know that have, have seen it at film festivals, friends of mine in Whistler and everything, they go, I never knew. I had no idea about that. So that's a, a beautiful thing in the movie to finally have, you finally get the story 
um, and and it's a great story. And of course, it you know launched the career of of mm. Alice. They never looked back from that day. Well, Johnny, this is fun. Is there anything else that you can uh, think of that I haven't told you or you haven't asked or we'd like no, to like post it? Um, I don't know. I mean, if you have to go, you more we can wrap this up as much as uh, I'm here to do as much as you'd like to do. I'm just honored that you're willing to sit down and have a conversation. Usually the podcast, we do an hour, but I don't want to take up all of your time, obviously. Well, if you have more questions, you know, the only thing is I don't want to get into spoiler alerts. Oh, yeah, because, for sure. Let me uh, yeah, let me shift gears and let me do a question that's more. I want to just learn more about yourself. We don't even have to okay. necessarily talk about the film. I'll, I will promote that and let people know where they can go to see it, of course. Um, but there's a question that I love asking my guests on the podcast. And if you could make a phone call to 15 year old John and give him a piece of advice, knowing what you know now, uh, doesn't affect your current timeline, so no investment advice. But <laughs> what would you tell a uh, fifteen-year-old version of yourself? Um, go to law school. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you, like stay out of music. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Go to law school and uh, start a hedge fund. Uh, you know, I sometimes think that my years and years of promoting and rock and roll and being in the entertainment business has been like this movie, a roller coaster ride of ups and downs and this and that. And I mean, I have a storied career of many legendary events aside from this one subsequently that were not and in any way as historically um, important as this one, but nonetheless, we're fraught with much of the same uh, on again, off again madness. And um, despite all of that, they, you know, coming to fruition and, and coming, you know, to be successful conclusions. But there's tremendous amount of, you know, not knowing this about promoting anything because you're always subject to the next moment of how that's going to go. It's like launching a company. It's starting a business, like a startup here, you know, in uh, any kind of Silicon world where everybody's got great aspirations and everything, but there's no guarantees of anything. You know, you may get a, mm -hmm. a mezzanine round of funding and then that's the end of it. You know, you got to be careful uh, to get your business up and running. And mm -hmm. I think, Advice I would have given to myself would have been uh, spend a little more time in school. You know, I left after uh, Upper Canada College. I did not go to university. I just could not wait to get out into the world. And prior to uh, to this momentous event of the Toronto Rock and Roll Revival, I was fortunate to have a lot of success in Toronto as kind of the first rock and roll promoter. That really got it into my blood to the point where like I was now hooked. And so that was the course that I was going to follow for at least the next 10 years. And then on into the eighties and the entertainment business became my world. And, um, so, you know, for better or for worse, that's where I, I, I lay my head at night. Um, I don't regret any of it. It's been a wild, magical ride. It's actually still going on. Um, what I love right now is that, you know, I have a, a, a very good friend of mine I've known for 30 years. She and I were coming back from the farmer's market a couple months ago. And she said, Johnny, you need to go on TikTok and tell some stories. And I'm going, are you crazy? She goes, <laughs> let, me, let me just film you. Cut to the chase. Rock and Roll Stories, Johnny Brower has over 500,000 views in the, in two months. Me wow. telling these little vignette stories. I've got 9,000 likes and several thousand uh, followers or whatever they're called. I haven't done anything on there for a couple of weeks. But I just turned into loving do, telling these little three-minute segments, even if we would make it part one, two, three, and four, and realizing the appetite out there for these stories and for this history and for the back in the day stuff. And, you know, I've done a couple of things where I've spoken to college audiences and just really quickly, I spoke at Fanshawe to a graduating class uh, four years ago before COVID, whatever. And, um, you know, my friend, the professor, uh, Mike Roth, had uh, been with Sony and I'd known him for years. And he said, you got to come down and talk to my graduating class. And he'd been asking me to talk to them for three years. But I was in Toronto. I went down there and I'm in his office and the hundreds of kids pouring into the auditorium. And he goes, well, what are you going to talk about? And I go, well, what do you want me to talk about? And he got this horrified look on his face like, oh, my God, <laughs> like you don't have anything ready. 
<laughs> and I went, well, what, what, you know, he asked me to come and talk to them and tell them stories. And he said, but I want you to like inspire them or something. I said, okay, okay, no problem. <laughs> inspire so them there. or something. <laughs> I go out there and there's a stool and some water and I start talking and you know, there, there's kids laughing and I'm telling them little vignettes and I'm telling them how I resolve things and all of that. And, uh, I look over at my friend, Mike, and, and I go, Mike, how am I doing? And he goes, eight. he had this huge smile on his face. He goes, 80 minutes. And I went, what? I've been talking for 80 minutes. Hey. <laughs> goes, yeah. Right? And I went, that's it, man. I just waved my hand and they uh, cracked up. And, but people came down. They wanted to take pictures. They wanted to ask yeah. me questions. And I realized that, you know, the appetite for these stories is there. Mm -hmm. And that I encourage more people that have those stories to share them um, because I believe that so many uh, people that have been in the back in the day and are still, you know, standing and have these great stories should realize that there's these uh, platforms out there now that you can just go on mm -hmm. and tell a story. And you don't even know it's going to catch fire or the zeitgeist is going to the next thing, you know, you got a hundred thousand followers are a hundred thousand this on this particular story about the rock and roll revival of the over 500,000 TikTok views, 300 plus thousand of them are about that. Hey everybody, Johnny here. Just want to take a quick second to thank our newest Patreon subscriber, CLB. I appreciate your support. And because you are subscribed to the show for just a dollar a month, you're getting this episode before anyone else. If you want to be cool like CLB, head to patreon.com backslash the Johnny Rogers and join in on the fun. All right, now back to the episode. Pulled it up here. This is your page, right? The rock and roll stories. Yeah, rock and roll stories, Johnny Brower sitting on the same couch that I'm on talking to you. <laughs> Perfect. I'll put that <laughs> yeah. in the description for people to watch too. But there is something as well about storytelling that especially during times like right now where, you know, there's like war happening and we're coming out of a pandemic. It's like stories are so important because they help further the next generation, right? And inspire the next generation as well. I know there's a lot of um, old wrestlers like uh, Mick Foley and whatnot that are doing like tours around america where he's just telling old wrestling stories that's his whole whole thing he just caters to only wrestling fans and tells them the stories behind the scenes in the locker room like you could probably do something like that john i don't know if you have something like that in the works but i would say i bet you could fill out theaters across the country just just telling these these stories and promoting the film you could even do q and a's if you wanted to but i would pay to see that well well there you go and thank you and i have considered that because of the fact that having done things like Fanshawe, it makes me realize that, you know, um, I have just the love of the stories and the love of the history to be able to share it extemporaneously without notes and without planning, without having you look at the, my cuff to see what's the next story. I <laughs> yeah. mean, these things, the worst thing you can ask me, Johnny, is what did you do last night? Okay, because <laughs> I'm, I'm like, now I'm like, oh, my God. But I'll tell you what happened 50 years ago or 40 years ago, yeah, what, was yeah. it, what they said, you know, what, what they were wearing and, and basically what happened, the richness of that experience. I love that. I was going to another question I was going to ask you is if you have any like morning routines, <laughs> but maybe yes, I, 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 I get a dog and I get outside and we go uh, and I get a, a flat white with oat milk and uh, and that's extra hot. And that's the morning startup. And on Monday, I have an ad shot. You know, it's like Monday morning ad shot. Let's get the week fired up. Let's get going. <laughs> um, that's really it. I'm a morning person and I always have dogs or, or a dog. And uh, and that's a critical thing. You know, like you can go to the bathroom when you get up, but you know, the dog needs to go out. <laughs> yeah, entirely. entirely. Uh, let me see if I had another one here for you. Oh, yeah. What kind of music are you listening to now? I know because you grew up in this time with like rock and roll, but rock and roll is it's changed so much music in general. Like it feels like hip hop really dominates the music scene right now with pop industry pop basically. But is there any bands currently that you're like, the, these people have something? Well, you know, I love a uh, rap because I love the poetry. I write poetry myself. I am a great fan of the rhyme and I'm absolutely astounded by people that can spit and just like jump up and, you know, extemporaneously just blow out these incredibly 
powerful messages that rhyme and have a cadence and all of that. I'm in awe of that kind of modern uh, music, whatever you want to call it, rap. Um, I love a great pop song. I mean, I, I'm just a, was a Beatle fan. I was not a big Rolling Stones fan, although I have some really favorite Rolling Stones songs, like I resonate with Street Fighting Man, for sure, <laughs> you know. But um, I uh, I love the pop songs and the, you know, just those songs that, you know, if you're not careful, man, you can cry. You know, mm. those are the songs that, that really get to me. And um, I just really will sometimes come along. I love Coldplay. You know, I'll, I'll hear a band. Um, I don't have like an active music listening uh, experience, but I'll hear something, you know, I have uh, daughters in their 20s and then I have another daughter, you know, in, in her early 50s who was born in 69. So back when this event was on, you know, I was married and I had a little daughter. It was like, you know, only a few months old. And wow. so a lot of my social circle back then were couples or people that had kids. You know, we were we were having kids early back in those days. It was like a hippie kind of a thing. Like, let's get married. Let's have a baby and put some flowers in our hair. You know, that was kind of where we were at. I maybe don't look like that in this movie because I didn't go to work with flowers in my hair. And beads yeah, of and course. Everything yeah. Because, you know, we had an office and we had it was became a clubhouse. Mm. more than an office it was a, like a clubhouse um was it the rock pile we had the rock pile so that was where we operated from but when kenny and i became very successful we needed a, an office and it became like a clubhouse you know that's where people came to hang out um that were in our kind of social circle and uh and that was a very exciting experience at the time because like, you know, we were in our early 20s, but we felt like, wow, we're really grown up. We have an office, you know, who had an yeah, office? Yeah. Only only big people had an office. Well, yeah. we got an office, well, you know, <laughs> but it became a clubhouse. So, yeah, there's just a lot of opportunity out there. I still feel like I am at the cutting edge of culture. Um, you know, I dropped an NFT of a piece of art a year and a half ago when it was in the stone age of nfts wow. i love i love being involved with these uh uh records uh, vinyl records with the cover by jean-michel basquiat it's an incredible honor to uh, be associated with any of his uh oeuvre and you know just to have acquired the rights to this back in 2016 taking it to paris taking it to new york um these are thrilling things uh, and just, you know, this whole thing that blew up on TikTok, you know, it makes me feel like, wow, you know, this is crazy. I'm like, I'm, you know, involved in contemporary culture. And yet people are, you know, resonating with me, telling them things that are 50 years old. Um, if, if when I was, you know, my early 20s, if somebody my age now had started telling me about stuff from 50 <laughs> years before, I would have fallen asleep. Okay. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we grew up in that era where that culture launched all of the culture that we live in now. And that we experience now has been built upon that. And so it's a, a great blessing to be able to remember those things. That's my number one gratitude every day is that I'm grateful that I remember all of this and that I'm capable of sharing it in a way that it resonates with other people. Yeah, and I think those the TikTok is probably the best medium for you. I was gonna say, uh, you know, doing a podcast as well like this, where you episode by episode, maybe you're telling a story about a certain thing. But I think TikTok is the is honestly the the right move. So kudos to you for, uh, you know, being brave enough to jump on that. Because I know people that are in their like early forties that are like TikTok. I'd never use that app. That's for kids. Blah blah. blah. I'm like, it's not. It's really not. <laughs> it's for it's really everyone. Not. You yeah, know, yeah. It's really not. And I was totally amazed when uh, we did the first couple of stories and my friend called me and went, Johnny, you're not going to believe this. Like we're at 20,000 views and I just put this up a few hours ago and I'm going, what? Your phone must be broken. You know, <laughs> and she yeah, thought, yeah. No, it's not, man. You don't understand something. This thing is blowing up. So anyway, and that was the story of the rock and roll revival was the first thing mm. that I told. So kudos to Ron Chapman for the perseverance, by the way, that he uh, has exhibited in order to take this six plus years ago and battle his way through the financing and all of the organizations. I mean, when you look at 
the trailer even or when you look at the film and you see the names of all the people and that who it took to get to believe in this to be able to finance it i mean that's the thing about being a director it's not directing the movie you've got to get the movie financed and you know the producers have to help as well but ron took this on as uh you know just a mission Mm -hmm. it was more than a labor of love it was a mission did he approach you to to do it, or was this something that you had an idea to oh, I, no, do? No, I, you... I had been campaigning for several years with several other people, and had a lot of smoke blown up, you know where mm, about yeah. yeah, we'll do this, we can do that, we'll do this, and I was having a huge New Year's Eve party at my uh, apartment in the Thompson Hotel. This is six years ago, and Ron showed up late, and he started yelling at me that you're not going to get this movie made. You need to let me make this movie. I can get this movie made. And I was like out of my mind anyway, you know. And I said, Ron, Ron, please stop yelling. If you stop yelling, if you stop yelling, okay, I'll give you the story. You you be the guy. And so he said, okay. And that was it. We shook hands and he put it together. Wow. So, I you know, that. Ron Ron was adamant. He was angry that I was struggling with this thing and that he had his own vision and that he just basically confronted me and demanded that I just stop what you're trying to do and I can do it. And he did. And he did. It did it in more than I would have could have ever imagined. And that's why the reviews on the film are so strong. And that's why people, you know, need to see this movie mm -hmm. because it's a great, great movie. And that's, it's a, it's that's a piece of music thing. history. It, it, yeah. Honestly, I think it, it will be something that will be shown in, you know, music theory classes in universities that, or recommended at least as like footage to watch to really even event promotion like the, just that in general, this piece of art is really educational in that terms as well of uh, just truly what it takes to get something like this done. Well, I have a sign on my back gate as you walk out to the parking lot, which says never, ever give up. Mm. And I think that this movie shows that that is something that has been something I've lived by and that I remind myself of every day because there are challenges in everything we do. And that it's like the lottery ticket. If you don't have one, you know one thing for sure. You're not going to win. OK, but if you have a one dollar ticket in your pocket, then that means you're never, ever giving up believing that one day that ticket will be the winning ticket for you. And I like to tell people that believe in yourself because that's the greatest motivating factor for yourself is to believe I can do it. It will happen. And whether it does or not, you still know that you believed in yourself and that that gets you to the next thing. Whether one thing does not materialize, regardless, you move to the next one with the same belief in yourself. Yeah. So there powerful. we go. That's Johnny Brower That's wrapping it up for you, John. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I appreciate it so much, John, for taking the time to do this. Um, I know I'll leave the in the description where people can uh, go watch the film because I know right now it's going to be streaming at film festivals um or playing i guess at film festivals yeah so playing but it's launching in toronto i'll, I'll tell you and, and ron will tell you as well when you talk to him it's going to be at hot docs uh, the toronto canadian premiere whatever will be at december 17th and there'll be q and a's uh, coming in from you know uh robbie krieger um getty lee will be there um Fantastic. i am planning on being there um and uh, ron of course will be there i forget who's the host who's uh, hosting it but that that's pretty much almost sold out but it's playing a number of dates um around that time and i think they're available on the hot docs uh, site or at least ron will have that information for you it's public information it's not a secret and yeah. it's something that it, i like to say this is toronto's movie mm. okay this is Toronto's movie. This is something Toronto should look at and go, wow, you know what? This happened here in our town, and it may have been the greatest secret in rock and roll, but it's not anymore. <laughs> well, okay? your legacy is cemented. I hope you have a yeah. great night, John. You too. Thank you so much, Johnny. All the best. All right. Take care. You've been listening to The Johnny Rogers Show. New episodes air every Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time.